This not our last You're year, not a child this year. No. Uh, well, yeah, so w- welcome to Uh This is class number 16. We're going to be talking about redemption tonight. And it is not our last class. Um, we have one more class to go. So tonight is redemption, and next week is glorification. It's where is this all headed? Uh, what's, the, what's the end? Karina uh, was mentioning that she is going to be out next week. And she said, uh, well, we're, gonna, we're gonna not going to be there for the hope. And I said, well, no, redemption has hope. I said, you're just going to be missing the point. So uh, <laughs> next, week, next week is the point. It's, it's the purpose for which this is all headed towards. So um, please do stick around. Uh, the class is lasting longer into the summer than I initially planned because of a bunch of things that happened along the way. Um, so thanks for sticking with. Um, if you're watching on video, thank you for watching the videos. Of course, let us know if you watch the video and you're doing this class for credit. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's pray and then we'll sing. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together tonight. Thank you for these wonderful folks. It's been a pleasure and an honor to work through some of this material with them and pray that you'll uh, bless our class tonight, that you would help us to be joined together as people and also uh, to learn from you about what, uh, what you're doing in this world. Lord, thanks for this chance to look into your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, our opening hymn tonight is number 261. 261. It's called Kingdom Prayer. Hymn number 261. I don't know it by this name, um, but I know the hymn. Hymn number 261. Um, And I'll start it up. Lord, we're broken, broken hearted, tired of going our own way. We've been proud and self-sufficient, but we're broken here today. Lord, we need your power within us. For we have none of our own. Take this broken heart and mend it with your power and yours alone. Lord, we're mourning, mourning children, mourning o'er the sins inside for they're always right before us much too great for us to hide lord we need your power within us for we have none of our own Take this morning heart and comfort with your power and yours alone. Lord, we hunger and we thirst for righteousness that's not our own. For we see our selfish motives, we need you to take your throne. Lord, we need your power within us, for we have none of our own. Take this hungry heart and fill it with your power and yours alone. Amen. All right. Let's take uh, 15 minutes and get together in your groups of three or four. Share how your week was and take some time to pray for one another. We have 15 minutes to do that tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for the chance for us to be together, to care for one another. 
by listening to one another and to care for one another by praying for one another. Lord, thank you for uh, these friendships that you are building and that you continue to support and maintain. Please bless the remainder of our time tonight. May it be a blessing to each of us. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> All right, well, let's gather back together. So, uh, yeah, I got actually, um, I got a lot of comments on today's sermon um, this, from this morning. I, I find that anytime I sing during a sermon, people really like it. So it's <laughs> that's kind of a weird thing. Uh, today, uh, the, where there was no live stream, however. So this is one of those sermons that is, people who heard it, heard it, and otherwise nobody else. Um, well, I actually, I, I mentioned this, I, I've been putting out notes for my sermons each Sunday the last few weeks. And uh, all of the notes got taken this morning, too. So I just printed off some more. So there's more notes there if you want those from today's sermon. Hmm? I, don't, I was um, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Uh, it's a hymn, and, and it, the last line is, It's only the splendor of light hideth thee. It is only the splendor of light hideth thee. Hideth thee. We talked about Psalm 104. It talks about God clothing himself in light. So... But that's not what we're talking about tonight. Tonight we're talking about redemption. We've been uh, going through the four basic uh, components of the Christian worldview story. We talked about creation. And that's what I preached on this morning, actually, in church. So next week I'm going to be preaching on the fall, actually. And we'll be doing redemption and then glorification in church. I, today, in, in, in the church service, I didn't want to just do what we did in Mathetes two weeks ago. So that's the way it'll be. Uh, I will be doing creation, fall, redemption, and glorification in the Sunday morning services, but they're not going to, the sermons are not going to be identical to what we do in Mathetes. So hopefully it'll be interesting for everybody. Well, we talked about creation, and the, the first part of the, the Christian story is that God created everything, and he created it good. He created it good. But it didn't stay that way. In last Mathetes, we talked about how the, the, uh, the sin of humanity was to turn humanity and, and the world in rebellion against God. And we call that the fall. Um, today, we're going to talk about the solution to the problem. Redemption. And next week, we'll talk about where it's all going, which is glorification. And some really good stuff uh, in all of these uh, parts of the Christian story. I want to pick up the story here partway between fall and redemption and, and talk about, close off our conversation about the fall just by talking about what didn't happen in the fall. It can, be, it can be really easy to sort of say the fall was devastating, and it was. The, the fall of, of humanity introduced death into the equation, right? Uh, suddenly human beings are um, plagued by death, and the relationships that we're involved in were broken. If you want to think of it this way, um, and we, we talked about it a little bit, but uh, as God talks about the results of the fall, in uh, the serpent's life, in Eve's life, and in Adam's life, we see that the relationship between humanity and the earth is broken, right? There is this, the, the breaking of, of the earth is going to now produce thorns and thistles, and there's going to be enmity between uh, the, the, uh, the serpent and the woman, who is a creature of the earth. A uh, serpent is a creature of the earth. Later on in the Noah story, you'll find that actually fear falls upon all the animals of the earth that separates, uh, the that breaks the relationship between humanity and the animals. Right? Um, we see the relationship with God is, is, is broken. Right? Um, the hum the man, male and female, Adam and Eve, they hide from God. They hide themselves away from God. Uh, we see that the relationship between uh, husband and wife is broken. We see the battle of the sexes that starts to take place in that, uh, in that fight uh, between Adam and Eve. And we also see uh, sort of the relationship between people and themselves. 
uh, shame as Adam and Eve cover themselves and try to hide away from, from God, but also hide away from each other. Uh, these are some of the relations that we, we also, talked, also talked about the relationship between mothers and their children being broken, all of these things. But we also said that, you know, even though these relationships are disrupted, they're not entirely shattered, right? We, we said last time that even though the relationship between the woman and her child is, is marked by pain now, there still will be children. God could have called the quits on the whole thing, but instead, there's still going to be children. Eve is called the mother of all the living. Um, so these relationships are disrupted, but they're not broken. The relationship between humanity and the ground, right? It'll produce thorns and thistles, but it'll still produce food. Okay? It's not over. Relationship with hum humanity and God. It's disrupted, but God actually reinitializes the relationship by clothing Adam and Eve and starting to deal with the, the shame issue. These are all these relationships, they're disrupted, but they're not people are not removed from our relationships. They're broken, but they're not destroyed. Okay? Now, so one of the things that doesn't happen in the fall is relationships are not destroyed. Another thing that doesn't happen in the fall is that humanity doesn't lose the purpose for which we're created. God created Adam and Eve, and he said, your purpose is to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth, and to subdue it. Okay? Um, they're created to, to rule over the earth. Well, that... that uh, function and to fill the earth, those are still active. And it happens through the bearing of children, but it also happens through uh, sort of um, uh, ruling over the, the animals and over, over the, the, the physical creation. But in addition to that, the, there's, there's two broad categories for the purpose that human beings have. One is to be in a relationship with God, and one is to be in a relationship with others. Right? Uh, relationship with God we might call a worship relationship. Okay? Our relationship with God is, is a worship relationship, and that has not changed. Um, we are still called as human beings to be in a worship relationship. That was the case uh, after Adam and Eve, and it's the case today. Um, we see early on in the story, after, uh, the, after the fall of humanity, we see Abraham called into a worship relationship with God. We see God reinstituting the worship relationship. And Abraham, one of the things, if you read the story of Abraham, you'll see there's, Abraham builds a lot of altars throughout his story. It seems to be a, 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 a thing that he does all the time. It's because Abraham is, is in a relationship of worship with God. But we're also in a relationship with one another. And our relationships with one another, I like to call a witness relationship. Witness, worship and witness. We demonstrate the, the power and the majesty of God to one another. We demonstrate God's purposes to one another. When we demonstrate it to people who don't believe in God, we always call that witness. But we also witness to the greatness of God to one another. We testify to the goodness of God with each other. These are the two purposes of humanity, to worship and to witness. Um, and those remain the same even after the fall. Because evil can't undo God's purposes. The, the point of the Bible is that evil does not have the last word. God is always going to have the last word. And in our, in our Christian world, there's this idea that somehow there's parts of life that are just wrong. Christians shouldn't be involved in that. Um, and, and I want to make an, a different argument. Uh, I want to I talk about, this is my, one of my favorite diagrams. So I want to give you one of my favorite diagrams. It's a, it's a diagram that I call structure and direction. And as far as I know, I came up with this. So I, 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 I'm not sure. I may have learned it from somebody and forgotten who I learned it from. But as far as I know, this is, this is mine. Uh, so, if you're watching on video and you taught me this, I apologize. Send me an email. Let me know. But, I mean, l let's, let's ask this question, right? Um, good or bad? It, tell me, is this, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, how about uh, business? Is business good or is it evil? Both. 
It's good on some level. Okay, depends. Uh, what about what about um, politics? Is it good or is it evil? Is politics good or evil? I would politics say politics sometimes. is more structure than. Well, we'll get we'll get there. It's a second, just a second. You're right. Do we actually have to pick one? No, uh, I, 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 I think I'm throwing out a question that's that's hard to answer, right? There's no gray there. Uh, the arts. Uh, religion. Is religion good or is religion bad? Food. food. Is food good or is food bad? Yeah, I Sexuality. Is sexuality good or is sexuality bad? Uh, law. Government. A lot of Christians believe that these things, some of these things, are the result of the fall. That these things are evidence of the fallenness of humanity. The truth is, though, and, and I don't think this is determinative, but I think everywhere you look where there are people, you have these things. Right? Uh, anywhere there's people, there's art. Right? People, they're drawing, they're singing, they're dancing. Right? It seems to be part of who we are as human beings. There's some sort of trade. Some sort of, I have this skill, you have that skill, let me do that for you, you do this for me. This, this sense of, of, of exchange. There's some sort of leadership, law, government, everywhere where there are people. There seems to be religion everywhere where there's people. Uh, food, I think food maybe doesn't fit in this little scheme. Food is a, an object, but it has, it has similar qualities. Sexuality, wherever you have people, you have sexuality. The, are these things good or are they evil? Well, neither, right? Where, where these things come in is that if these things serve God, arts that serve God or that fulfill God's purposes are good. Right? Politics that fulfills God's purposes are good. Um, but but if, it, if they're in rebellion against God, law or government that's in rebellion against God is evil. But law or government that's following God's purposes is good. Religion that is in rebellion against God is bad. But religion that's serving God is good. The arts can serve God or they can be in rebellion against God. Sexuality can serve God or be in rebellion against God. Business can serve God or be in rebellion against God. God's purposes, food. <laughs> you can use food the way God intended or you can use food the way God didn't intend, right? Um, uh, in politics, we well, didn't do politics. It is definitely possible to for politics to be in rebellion against God. I know that's hard to believe. Um, <laughs> Any one of these things can be in can can serve God and God's purposes, or can be in rebellion against God and God's purposes. This is what I would say is the difference between structure and direction. Okay, evil is not a thing. Evil is not a thing that exists in this universe. You can't go and get ten pounds of evil or to collect evil in one place. Okay? Rather, evil is a direction that things can take. Evil is a direction that we can take with our lives. Evil is a direction, not a structure. And what you see in the fall is all things start to serve rebellion. All sectors of, all structures of the world start to serve rebellion. And what God does in redemption is to start to turn the arrows back toward himself through us. And we'll be talking about that as we go along. But the things that are built into the structure of the cosmos, the created order, the things that we do because we're human, these things are structures. They're not good or bad. They can be used to serve good or used to serve bad. But direction is the allegiance or the orientation that we give those things. There, there has, there was, especially in the Christian world in the medieval times, there was this, um, this sacred secular split that said some things, religion especially, are good. 
and they're inherently better than other things. Um, if, you, if this was your job, if religion was your job, then you were holier than other people. You were set apart. Um, and, uh, of course, what we saw in the medieval church was that a lot of times the people who were serving God were actually serving themselves instead. Um, and the Protestant Reformation was to say, look, there is evil religion, even evil religion that comes in the name of Christ. Um, because what matters is, is it serving God and his purposes, or is it in rebellion against God and his purposes? You may does it understand this makes sense, this diagram? I find this diagram really helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or artichoke. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's an artichoke. Uh, no wonder I like it. Artichokes are my favorite vegetable. Oh, yeah. um, but this, this is, yeah, this, this. I, I think about this all the time. This is something that I think about all the time as, as a, a helpful way to think about the world that we live in, um, and I hope that it's helpful to you as well. Didn't religion in medieval times kind of take over the political arena? Oh yeah, right. The power of, I mean, I think that that's part of what brought about the thinking that religion well, there was something wrong with religion. Well, yeah. So I have another diagram. Oh, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> it's it's an issue all the time. It's never it's never not been an issue. Um, all right, I'm gonna. I've told Karina I wasn't gonna do this, but I knew in the car even as you came. I I gotta do this. <laughs> Uh, so this 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 is this is my all-time favorite diagram. I didn't think I was going to have time. I don't have time to do it, but we're going to do it anyway because this this question is a very good one and it, and it's and it's one that I think we have to grapple with. How wh how do you understand when things get out of kilter? Wh what is going on? And and uh, stick with me on stick with me. <laughs> stick with me on this one. Human beings are created for a relationship with God. This is something that's key at the core of humanity is, is a need to be in relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? We are created with this inner uh, uh, orientation towards God. Um, people, people can point their hearts towards God and He can respond. Okay? Or he can point himself to us and we can respond, however you want to think about it. But we're, we're, we're formed for a relationship with God. Our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. Right? That's one of the, the, those, the things that are just, we are formed for a relationship with God. Um, we're also formed, and that's our primary relationship, is our relationship with God. We're also formed for relationships with people. Um, let's say male-female relationships, could be friendships, could be romances, anything like that. We're formed for relationships with um, our parents and child, right? We're, we're formed for parent-child relationships. Um, everybody is a child of a parent. Not everybody is a parent of a child. But that's part of the, the, the stuff of what it means to be human, is to be involved in those kinds of relationships. And uh, we're also neighbors, right? We also have a relationship with people who we're not related to. Okay, um, male-female relationships, parent-child relationships, neighbor relationships. These are stand-in for every human relationship, right? We're 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 created primarily for a relationship with God, secondarily for a relationship with other people. Okay, this is when Jesus was asked, "What's the great commandment?" He said, "Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself." Right? Uh, relationship with God, relationship with people. When, we, when these things happen, when we're in relationship with God, relationship with people, or even when those are broken, we wind up with all sorts of other things happening. Uh, and we've talked about, you know, the arts, um, politics, uh, economics, uh, religion. Um, uh, I'll put food in there, why not? Because I can remember it. Uh, what else do we have on there? Business. Education, law, right? We could we could fill this with any other part of human culture, right? Um, this is the culture that we create when we're together as people. Um, I'm gonna just for the sake of doing it, label this first circle here R1, 
the second is relationships. These are our primary relationships, right? Our, 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 our primary relationships, it's our secondary relationships, and this is our cultural relationships or our, our third relationships. R1, R2, R3. Um, we are created for relationships and we create relationships as we go through our life. Now, here's the deal. The human self only works if God is in the center. Okay, that's when, that's when we hum. It's when God is in the center. Uh, and, and, but things go wonky when you put a relationship with God in any other circle. Okay? When you take the relationship with God and you make it a cultural thing, the whole engine goes out of whack. Right? The whole human life. How many people have you met who will take economics and put it in the center of their lives? Right? Take an R3 thing, make it an R1 thing, and suddenly they have, there's an idolatry of money. What happens when you see people take their child and put their child in the center of their life? Right? Their life is destroyed. Nothing else works as the basis for a life, a healthy human life, than a relationship with God. This is... Huh? The tire goes flat. The tire goes flat. Yeah, right. It's, it's off its axle. Right? Um, but what happens when you have... Let's, what happens when you take, let's say... Uh, oh, no, that's what, I, that's what I want. What happens when you take male-female relationships and turn them into economics? Pornography. Power. Right? Uh, power, yeah, power, in, imbalance of power in relationships. Prostitution. Right? Taking male-female relationships and putting them out here. Uh, what happens when you take male-female relationships and you, and you turn it into the arts? Right? We try to, try to, try to take male-female relationships and make them uh, part of a cultural expression. Well, you wind up with smutty TV. You, know, you wind up with, uh, with, with things that should not be seen in public, now broadcast in public. <coughs> this, this diagram, I call it the circle diagram, this diagram, I think, helps to understand why is it that religion has been a force for good and a force for evil in this world, right? When you take religion and make it in the center, you have a problem. Because religion is not our relationship with God. Religion is all the, the trappings of our relationship with God. They make those more important. In the medieval times, uh, the relationship with God was confused with politics. Right? And today, the same is the case. Right? Whenever you see uh, politics try to go in the center, as if it was politics was the God you have so many, so many issues. It becomes a form of idolatry. And I, I, I use the form, phrase idolatry for anything going in the center that doesn't belong there. And if something goes in the center that doesn't belong there, God goes somewhere else. Either God is our buddy, right? Or God is some cultural product that uh, has no relevance to the center of our lives. Um, I could, I could talk for an hour about this diagram. It's been tremendously influential in my life. This is how I understand the world. So I, I hope it's helpful to you. I wasn't planning on doing it tonight, but I could not help myself. <laughs> Any questions or thoughts? All right. This one I did not invent. <coughs> this one I got at a, at a retreat that I went to as a junior in college, and it transformed my life. All right. Let's talk about redemption. We're talking about redemption. Okay, so that's, that's what happened in the fall. These are sort of ideas about what happened in the fall. The Bible tells the story, though, of how God undoes all of that. How does God uh, work? How's God been working in the world, and how is God working in the world to change all that? We'll talk first about the Old Testament. Um, if, if I could sum up the Old Testament in one phrase, okay, it would be, God does not give up. He keeps pursuing his people. 
God does not give up. He keeps pursuing his people. That is, I think, the story of the Old Testament. People keep wrecking our relationship with God. People keep wrecking each other. And God keeps going after them. God just doesn't give up. He's always pursuing his people. He's always pursuing a relationship with his people. God's forming relationships of caring with people. And the, the, the form that these relationships with people wind up taking in the Old Testament is the form of the covenant. Okay? God forms covenants with people. A covenant is a, 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 a promise or an agreement between two parties when it's a God or three parties when it's a people. If I make a covenant with Karina, the covenant is in the eyes of God, right? So there's three parties in an in a, in a interpersonal covenant. But when you make a covenant with God, God is both the person you make the covenant with and the person who watches over the covenant. There's the three parties to a covenant are, uh, you know, party one, party two, and God, okay, Over, overseeing it. Um, when when God is party two or party one, then there's only two parties in the in the relationship. So covenant it's a, it's a relationship uh, of agreement between two people of promise. God throughout the Old Testament is calling people to re-enter a relationship with Him for their own good. Good question. We're gonna we're gonna go into that. That'll be we'll, we'll, in about three minutes. We're gonna start talking about that. Um, absolute number? No, but I'm gonna talk about several of the covenants. So we'll talk about how well, how that works. Um, the flip side of covenant is kingdom. It's not the opposite of covenant. It's the it's it's the same coin. When you look at when you look at uh, covenant from, from one perspective. When you look at the other side, what you see is kingdom. God is setting up the kingdom of God throughout the Old Testament. A covenant is an agreement between two parties under God. It's establishing God's rule over, uh, over the people of the earth. Adam and Eve had turned in rebellion against God and covenants are a way of bringing humanity back into a right relationship with God, where God is the ruler. If I were to describe the kingdom of God, what I would say, Karina said I haven't used pink, I need to use pink. Uh, the kingdom of God is God's people. I blame everything on Karina. She's like, my circle diagram has Karina in the center. <laughs> The kingdom of God is God's people in God's place under God's rule. How do you know where the kingdom of God is? Well, it's where God's people are in God's place under God's rule. Okay? Um, and I'm, we're going to talk about how this plays out in the rest of the Old Testament. God's people in God's place under God's rule. Uh, Alright, so covenants in the Old Testament. Bam! We're going to go there. We're going there! Um, <laughs> So, I mean, pri of course, primarily, the primary covenant in the Old, the first covenant in the Old Testament is between Adam and God, okay? Uh, there, God makes a covenant with Adam and Eve, uh, you know, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. Uh, God makes that covenant with Adam and Eve, and um, there is, uh, elsewhere in the Old Testament, it talks about Adam breaking God's covenant. So even though the word covenant is not used in the Adam and Eve story, uh, the, the rest, there are places in the rest of the Old Testament which say that Adam broke God's covenant. But the, 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 uh, the post-fall co first covenant is the covenant that God makes with Noah. Okay? And uh, if you want the theological term, the covenant with Noah is the Noahic covenant. They are, for some reason, theologians add a C in there. I don't know why when they talk about Noah's covenant. But the covenant with Noah is in Genesis chapter... Nine, and I'm not going to be able to go into detail on all these covenants, but a few things are key about Noah's covenant. The first one is that God tells Noah to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Okay, the same commands God gave to Adam, God gives to Noah. Okay, so God is reestablishing the Adamic covenant with Noah. God tells Noah that the that 
humankind is created in the image of God. And that's the basis for the death penalty that God gives in the Noah, in, in, to Noah in the Noah story. But he reaffirms that even after the fall, human beings are still created in the image of God. The image of God has not been destroyed in humanity. That's very key to recognize from the Noah, the Noah covenant. Uh, some people will say that we were created in the image of God, but we no longer are because of the fall. Well, Noah puts the lie to that. Um, so those are two key things in, in the Noah covenant that I want to just highlight. There's a ton more, and honestly, I would love to spend an entire class just on Genesis chapter 9, but I can't. So let's talk about the next covenant in the Old Testament. This is the covenant with Abram. In Genesis chapter 12, God calls this fellow Abram and starts to establish a relationship with him. God says... Um, for him to go, to leave his, uh, the, where he grew up, and to go to a place where God's going to show him. And God says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to make you into a great people. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a great name. You're going to be a blessing to everybody around you. I'm going to bless everybody who blesses you. I'm going to curse everybody who curses you. And through you, all peoples on earth will be blessed. This is the covenant that God makes with Abram in Genesis chapter 12. God is turning Abram into God's people in Genesis chapter 12. Okay? He's saying, you follow me and I'm going to make you a great nation. Okay? I'm going to establish my kingdom through you. And you're going to be my people. You, uh, that's what's going to happen through you. Now, that's not the last covenant with this same person. But we're going to call him, after this, Abraham. Because in Genesis... Uh, I'm sorry. He's still Abram in Genesis chapter 15. So Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 15 are covenants with Abram. In Genesis 12... Je uh, Abram becomes God's people. Genesis chapter 15, God promises him land. In Genesis chapter 15, God says to Abram, um, I'm going to give you the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the otherites. Okay? All of them ites. Uh, it's going to be your inheritance. I will be with you. He reiterates, you're going to be a great nation. You're, nation, you're going to be a blessing. Um, but, he says, I'm going to give you the land. So suddenly, uh, this second covenant with Abram, second statement of the covenant, involves God's place, the promised land. Okay? And then in Genesis chapter 17, uh, God actually changes Abram's name to Abraham. And he gives uh, Abraham the promises again, but he, he demands from Abraham a sign of obedience. The sign of circumcision. Okay? Uh, I, God demands that Abraham demonstrates that God is his ruler by going through circumcision. Okay? So, in Genesis 17, God's rule is established over Abraham. Okay? Three times God in, uh, talks about covenant with Abraham. Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17. God is establishing his kingdom with Abraham. Fast forward to the book of Exodus. Um, and we're going to go now to Sinai. Okay, this is Exodus chapter 24. Uh, God gives the Ten Commandments. He, he proclaims that this is my covenant with you. And he gives the Ten Commandments, which are things that humans need to obey. Uh, and confirms and puts into law in the people of Israel, the provisions that God had given to Abraham. So they suddenly become a legal code, not just sort of how Abraham ought to live, but these things become a legal code with penalties for disobedience. So God actually takes what it means to be God's people in God's place, under God's rule, and he, he turns these into a, a law. Okay? This is what happens in the Sinai Covenant. God makes a specific covenant with the people of Israel and says, this covenant is now your law. Now, how do we picture this? In a, a third diagram. I've even got more diagrams coming. Uh, 
the covenant with Adam and with Noah are covenants with all of humanity. Okay? Covers all of humanity. Because Adam and Noah are the first human beings. Adam is the first human being, but then all of life is compressed to the life on the ark. And Noah becomes the second Adam, the second progenitor of humanity. So these are, these are covenants that God makes with all people through Adam and through Noah. When we get to Abraham, God makes a covenant with specific people. Okay? This is God using one nation to bless all nations. Okay? Um, it's, the, the scope is still all the world. But the people the covenant is made with are, let's say, the covenant people. Okay? A smaller subset of humanity. Hoping to introduce people into it. But it's a smaller subset of humanity. The Sinai covenant is even more limited. This is a covenant with Israel, specifically. So each of these covenants gets smaller and smaller as the Old Testament goes on. Okay? Does this make sense? All right, we're going we're gonna, to, in a minute, we're going to go to the New Testament and we're going to see how the covenant becomes even smaller. But we'll get there in a minute. A couple of other components that are key about uh, life in God's kingdom. One, we've talked about law. Um, law serves at, the law of the Old Testament serves as a picture of what it looks like to live as a faithful people under God's rule in an agrarian culture. Right? Um, God, is, God, through the, the, the law of Moses, God teaches Israel how to be God's people in God's place under God's rule in their specific context. But the law has principles in it that wind up being applicable for all people. Um, you know, we may not, uh, there's, a, there's a law about if you see your neighbor's ox fallen into a ditch, if you see your enemy, if you see your enemy's ox fall into a ditch, help him to pull the ox out. That's one of the laws. Um, you might look at me and say, Pastor House, I have ne I honestly, honestly, honestly have never seen my enemy's ox fallen into a ditch. I believe you. So I have followed that law perfectly. Okay. <laughs> However, I have seen my enemy have a flat tire by the side of the road, and I did not help him. Okay? Is the principle the same? Yeah. It is. Right? The specific legal context, the specific cultural context might not be the same, but the principle is the same. That, it, that when, you're, when your enemy is in need of help, you give your enemy help. That's the principle that's embodied in that law. Okay, So the law takes the, these principles of, of what it means to live as God's people in God's place under God's rule and puts them in one specific context. God says to the, the Israelites, uh, I want you to have all of your sheep pass under the rod and every tenth sheep you're to tap on the back and every tenth sheep that passes under the rod you'll give to, uh, give to as your tithe to God. Okay, You can say to me honestly, Pastor House, I have given a tenth of every sheep I've ever owned <laughs> to the Lord. And I believe you. Right? Um, but, as the, because you're not shepherds, there's other, the principle actually is, can be applied in other situations. Right? Every tenth sheep? Okay. What about every tenth dollar that comes into your possession? You know? Maybe that's how we tithe in a modern day context. Just as a suggestion. Right? The principle is still there. So law is one key component of living as God's people in God's place under God's rule. And the law might look different in different cultural contexts, but it has the same principles. In the Old Testament also, we're given three offices, uh, three offices for people to inhabit and to, to fulfill, three offices that help maintain the covenant and maintain the kingdom. And these three offices are prophet, priest, and king. Okay? The prophet teaches God's... Uh, actually, I'm sorry, let, let me start with the priest. The priest actually teaches God's law. That's the purpose of the priest, is to teach God's law and to be a mediator between God and man. 
Okay? When, when human beings break the law, the priest is there to help offer sacrifices to restore people back into fellowship with God. <laughs> That's the purpose of the priest, to be a mediator and a teacher. The prophet, when the people turn against God, the prophet is there to call people back into a relationship with God, to point out where they're falling short so that they can uh, be encouraged to come back into a relationship with God. The prophet calls people back to a relationship with God. He reminds them of the covenant. He reminds them of the law. But... Uh, the prophet's primary role is to draw people back into a relationship with God. Um, we often think of prophets as being fortune tellers, right? Or future tellers. The, the only, only context in which prophets tell the future is in telling the story of God's covenant relationship with humanity. And they'll tell the future of that relationship. Um, but what they're telling people is, this is the covenant that God made with you and here's how the covenant is coming to pass. And here's how it will come to pass in the future. Past, present, and future in light of God's plan. The prophet, as if you read the prophets, they talk about the past more often than they talk about the future. And they talk about the present most often of all. Okay? Prophets are not just future tellers. So the, the priest teaches the law and mediates between God and man. The prophet calls people back to a relationship with God. And the king establishes justice ruling over uh, God's people. Administrating, protecting, uh, under the law. These are the three Old Testament offices uh, that the people of Israel had to draw them into a relationship and keep them in a relationship with God in the covenant in God's kingdom. And through it all, God never gives up. People keep turning away from God. God keeps pursuing them and drawing them back into a relationship with Him. This process is the process of redemption in the Old Testament. God is using his, the covenant with people and kingdom. God's using prophet, priest, and king to draw people into a relationship where every part of their lives is God-focused rather than rebellion-focused. Okay? That's God's plan in the Old Testament, is drawing every part of life back into a Godward direction. Okay? This is God's plan of redemption in the Old Testament. But the key that you need to remember about the Old Testament is that ultimately those things don't work. Okay? This is the key, is that the, in the Old Testament, even with this covenant with all humanity, even with the covenant with all covenant people, and even in the covenant with just the nation, the people keep breaking God's covenant. And they can't keep God's covenant in the Old Testament. And that's the problem. And the Old Testament is written to display how even in ideal situations, people cannot keep God's covenant because we're broken on the inside. That's the problem. And that's why we go to the New Testament and Jesus brings what's known as the New Covenant. The New Covenant is prophesied in the Old Testament. Now, I'm not going to read these passages, but you can look at Jeremiah 31, 31 uh, and, and following. You can look at, uh, and it's uh, talked about in the New Testament in Luke uh, 2220 and elsewhere in Jeremiah God says you have broken every covenant I've given you so here's the deal I'm gonna make a new covenant and this new covenant you will be unable to break because it's a one-sided covenant okay I'm gonna be the person who makes the covenant and the person who fulfills the covenant and if you're in the covenant you're good right you don't have to fulfill the covenant I'll fulfill the covenant because what happens is ultimately the covenant narrows down to one person okay Jesus one of the cool things and I wish I could do this at length with you guys but if you want to Take the book of Mark. And if you take the Gospel of Mark and you look at the Gospel of Mark 
and you read the, the Gospel of Isaiah, the, the book of Isaiah alongside the Gospel of Mark, you'll see that Mark talks about Isaiah and refers to Isaiah all the time. He's, he's making all these references to Isaiah. Usually doesn't say that he's making a reference, but they're, they're there. They're allusions to the, to the book of Isaiah. And ultimately, what Mark is trying to show you is that Jesus is Israel. That's what he wants to show you in the book of Mark. He wants to show you that Jesus is Israel. And because Jesus is the, the last Israel who, who keeps God's covenant, uh, Jesus fulfills God's covenant on Israel's behalf. And everyone who joins themselves into, into Jesus winds up fulfilling the covenant through him. It's really a powerful argument that the covenant has narrowed down from all humanity to people who willingly join the covenant to the nation of Israel to one man. The true Israel. Uh, just a couple of examples, right? What is what uh, beginning of the Gospel of Mark says that Jesus came proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and the first thing Jesus does in the Gospel of Mark is he goes to John the Baptist. He goes into the water, comes out of the water, and goes right into the desert, right? Just like Israel went into the Red Sea, out of the Red Sea, and directly into the desert. Jesus is in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. Israel was in the desert for. 40 years, right? And <laughs> 40 years and <laughs> lots of nights. Jesus, and you, again, you go, through, you go through the Gospel of Mark, you see this everywhere. Jesus is Israel. He does the stuff that Israel does, only better. And he, he actually fulfills the things that Israel is supposed to fulfill. Jesus becomes the, the person who is Israel. Jesus also is the prophet, priest, and king. Bam! Jesus fulfills. Now, there's lots of um, bad prophets in Israel's history. I, I love reading the book of Jeremiah, and there are all these prophets saying, saying all these things that are not contrary to God's will. One prophet takes this uh, set of of horns. He takes a set of ox horns and sticks them on his head and he's like he's walking around with ox horns and he's telling the king of Israel, you're going to win the battle. You're going to spear them like an ox spears uh, its, its, its enemies, right? And, and I just, I love watching it. And, the, and God says through Jeremiah, he says, you are a fool putting these stinking horns on your head and you not even talk to God about this. Right? Bad prophets. Uh, they're bad priests in the Old Testament. Right? Eli is a good example of a bad priest. But there's other, many other bad priests. And there's certainly bad kings in the Old Testament. Well, Jesus comes, and Jesus is the perfect prophet calling people back to a relationship with God. He's the perfect priest teaching God's law and mediating between God and man. And Jesus is the perfect king ruling over all. Jesus takes the three key Old Testament offices and he he fulfills them himself. Okay? Jesus comes in to fix every relationship. We talked about the relationship between people, between husband and wife. We talked about the relationship between uh, mother and child. We talked about the relationship between people and the earth. Jesus comes, and all those other relationships that are, that are broken but not destroyed. Jesus comes to restore all of the brokenness in all the relationships of the world through his life, his death, and his resurrection. Jesus comes to make what's wrong right. He comes to restore the relationship between God and man. Jesus is proclaimed in the New Testament, specifically Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 18. Romans 5, 12 through 18, Jesus is proclaimed as the second Adam. He's the second Adam. Through Adam, sin entered into creation. Through Jesus, salvation enters into creation. Now, there's four different ways, it's probably more than four, but I'm going to talk about four tonight. Four different ways that Christians have viewed salvation. Jesus comes to bring salvation to humanity. How does that work? Well, one perspective on salvation is that salvation is about wholeness, making people whole. This idea is that sin is a sickness that invades us all. And we need to be cured of that sickness. Jesus said, right, uh, it is not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. Right? I have come 
to be the, the great physician, right? This is the idea that, Jesus, that sin is a sickness and Jesus is the cure. Jesus is the, the, the great physician. Um, Jesus is there to restore wholeness to the relationships of our lives. Another perspective that Christians have had on salvation is that salvation is about liberation. We are in bondage to sin, and sin is a bondage. Not a sickness, but a bondage. Or, I'm going to argue it's both a sickness and a bondage, but th this idea is that what sin primarily is, is chains. And that what Jesus comes is to set us free from the chains that bind us. Um, the theological term for this is Christus Victor. Okay? That Jesus wins. <laughs> right? Jesus wins the battle. Jesus conquers the enemy. Jesus sets us free. That's the idea there. Uh, victory over sin, victory over death, victory over Satan. Jesus is able to set us free because uh, Jesus uh, wins the battle. Third, third perspective on salvation is that salvation is about forgiveness. Okay? This is the idea that sin is guilt or debt. And God can't simply proclaim sin for, uh, canceled. The debt needs to be paid. The guilt needs to be atoned for. And that Jesus comes to satisfy the just punishment of God. That Jesus takes the punishment of God on himself. Jesus stands in on our behalf as our representative in the covenant. And though we've broken the covenant, Jesus takes the punishment that comes from violating the covenant on himself. Right? He's, he's a substitute for us. He forgives our sins. And the last perspective on salvation that Christians have by and large believed is this idea of salvation as personal affirmation. This is the idea that Jesus came to show us that God truly loves us. That God has not stopped loving us. Sin, in this perspective, is separation from God. Relational separation. And what Jesus came to do is to bring us back into a relationship with God. To expose us as sinners, judge us as sinners, but affirm the astonishing love of God, that God has come to draw human beings back into a relationship with us. One of the things that's interesting if you read Christian theology is to watch people who believe these various perspectives squabble with each other about which one is true. And I sit here thinking, they're all true, <laughs> right? Salvation is, I mean, sin is a sickness that infects us all. And we do need a great physician to restore health to our bones and our souls. Sin is bondage, and we do need Jesus to set us free and liberate us. Uh, he, we do need Jesus to conquer sin and death on our behalf. Sin is guilt and debt, and we do need to be forgiven from that sin. And Jesus needs to take the punishment for our sin on himself. And Jesus is a clear demonstration that God has not stopped loving us and has kept pursuing us even when we've spit in his face. I don't think these are four uh, opposing views of salvation. I think that salvation is all of this and more. This is what Jesus has come to do. Jesus has come to proclaim wholeness, liberation, forgiveness, and the love of God all in one package. So Jesus has come to reconcile us to God, to restore the relationship between God and man, and he does it through salvation. That's the idea of salvation. Oh, I'm, i got to cook here. got to cook. We're almost done. Jesus also came to reconcile humans to humans. He came to, re to reconcile us to one another. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29 says that <laughs> Jesus came to break down the dividing walls that separate us from one another. Jew from Gentile, male from female. Right? In Christ, it says in Galatians 3.26, in Christ there is no male or female. There is no Jew or Greek. There is no slave or free. All the divisions, all the walls of hostility that bound, uh, barred us from one another, Jesus eliminates in himself. This is one of the great things about being part of the church. Right? I, I, and I, you know, I, I lived through uh, the, the church growth movement, which still kind of has its, its uh, 
ebb right now, or if, uh, it's still sort of moving a little bit. But this idea that the churches need to be built up of, and the idea behind the church growth, <laughs> the idea behind the church growth movement was, if you bring together people who are very very similar, they'll tend to attract people who are very very similar, right? If you get enough yuppies together in one room. It's a very attractive group to bring other yuppies in. And so the best way to build a big church is to bring together a homogenous group of people. People who are a lot like each other. That's the church growth movement's basic principle. And it works. It's a great way to build a group of a lot of, different, a lot of people. But they're all the same. Right? They're all people who are very much alike. And what you end up with is a group of people that are a mile wide and an inch deep. Right? It's a horrifying thing, in my view. <coughs> what I think the church is all about is to bring together male and female, slave and free, Greek and, and Jew. Bring, to people, bring together people who are so unlike each other that only Jesus could hold them together. And that's a way to get a, a group of people that are a yard wide and a mile deep. And you know what? Give me a church of 100 people that are a mile deep rather than a church of 2,000 people who are an inch deep. Any day of the week. That's what's going to transform the world. Jesus, through people who are, who are fully saved and who are fully reconciled to God and to one another, that's where the power is going to spill forth. Not over, oh, you're able to get a stadium full of people who don't know each other, don't care about each other, and, and have never had a disagreement with one another because they've never had a conversation with one another. Right? To that I say, bah, Loney, right? That is not what God's plan is. So Jesus came to reconcile us to, to God, but also came to reconcile us to one another by breaking down in himself the dividing walls. And lastly, God is, uh, Jesus came to restore our relationship with creation. Notice, we're going through the three relational circles, right? Our relationship with God, our relationship with people, and our relationship with creation, with culture. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. We need to live according to the heavenly order, not according to the earthly order. Everything that we do, whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all to the glory of God. Right? Whatever you do. Do you go to the supermarket? Go to the supermarket for the glory of God. Do you make shoes for a living? Make shoes for the glory of God. Right? Whatever you do, Martin Luther, one of the great uh, reformers of the Protestant church, said that, uh, that the street sweeper, the guy who sweeps the street, if he sweeps the street for Jesus, has just as holy a vocation as the priest. Right? Go out there and, and do what God has called you to do to the glory of God the Father, the best of your ability, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your vocation is just as holy as the vocation of a priest. What does Jesus say? We, uh, what does Paul say? We need to take every thought captive to Christ. Even our thoughts, every thought needs to be captive to Christ. We need to live by the Spirit. We need to be in a relationship with the King of creation every minute of every day. Jesus asks for nothing less than our complete allegiance. And it's, it's not when we're in the church building only. It's when we're in the church building, when we're in our homes, when we're in our cars, when we're giving to the homeless, when we are angry with our brother. Those are all times when Jesus demands our complete allegiance. Jesus wants to be the complete king. Jesus comes to reconcile humanity with God, humanity with each other, and humanity with all of creation. Now when I say all of creation, how big a deal am I talking about? And that's our last point tonight, is the question, how broad is Christ's redemption? We did Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20 uh, several weeks back, and one of the things that we talked about, is, and one of the things that you notice, and again, I want you to look at this passage when you have the time, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. The words, all things, are repeated in this uh, chapter a ton of times. And it's like, what is it, five verses. Uh, Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. And it says, first off, that Jesus created all things. All things. So, the scope of the word all things includes everything Jesus created. The, Colossians 1 says that Jesus sustains all things. 
And Colossians 1 says that Jesus came to redeem all things. So, when I read Colossians chapter 1, I'm the kind of guy, I say if he's going to use the word all things, all things, and all things, it has a similar meaning in each of those contexts, right? Jesus created all things, Jesus sustains all things, and Jesus has come to redeem all things. What does all things mean? In redemption, it means what it means in creation and what it means in sustaining all the world. Jesus is Lord over everything. Hence the box. Hence the box, right. This has to do with Jesus because Jesus has something to do with every part of our lives. I am teaching this to our kids every Sunday. Okay, that's, that's the goal of the box, is that they, the kids would know that Jesus has something to say about every part of their lives. Um, how broad is redemption? How broad is the fall? What part of the fall does Jesus not want to undo? He wants to undo all of it. A theologian named Abraham Kuyper put it this way. I just, you got to hear this. Abraham Kuyper said, There is no part of this creation about which Jesus Christ does not say, This is mine. It belongs to me. There is no part of this creation about which Jesus Christ does not say, This is mine. It belongs to me. Now, Satan wants it. But Jesus has it. Okay? And Jesus will have it. God's promise is a promise of complete restoration of the whole creation. God's working in us and through us to restore creation to its ultimate goal. We're going to talk about its ultimate goal next week, glorification. But the purpose of redemption, you guys are going to miss it, sorry. The purpose of God's redemption is to redeem all things through Christ. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to do this last diagram. This is a fun diagram. This is from a guy named Richard Niebuhr. Richard Niebuhr. Richard Niebuhr. He's a German theologian. He wrote a book called Christ and Culture, and I have it in my office. Um, great book, profound book. One of the um, one of the best books I've ever written. And what what Niebuhr says is that there's he use, he says three. I'm I'm limiting it to four, but he says there's. Th there's four, I'm going to say three, different ways that Christians have viewed the relationship between Christ and culture. One is that Christ is against the culture. Christ is against the culture. Jesus said, do not be in the world. Right? The world is evil. The world will be destroyed. The church is called out of the world. The church is a city set on a hill. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. And it will draw people to itself by being separate. Be a part. Be a testimony to the guilt of the world by its distance and by its difference. Christ stands against what the culture stands for. Jesus says no to our culture. Right? Right? The other side of this coin is Christ of culture. Okay? Christ of culture. Don't be in the world. The Christ of culture says you need to be of the world. That basically the only way that Christians are going to influence society is by keeping up with society's progress. Right? Let's, let's be what the world... The world has the ability to shape the church. The world is created by God and thus is mostly good. The church's mission is to infiltrate and to preserve what's good in God's creation, like the salt of the earth. Right? Christ against culture says... You are a city set on a hill. Christ of culture says, you're the salt of the earth. You need to penetrate in, preserve, protect, influence. Christ is the highest expression of the good of creation. Christ against culture says, you are the light of the world. Christ of culture says, you are the salt of the earth. Right? What Niebuhr points out, and I think this is golden, is that Jesus said both, you are the light of the world and you are the salt of the earth. 
right? Jesus said, you are the city that is set on a hill, and you're the salt of the earth in the same chapter, right? And what Niebuhr says is that the third pr perspective is that Christ transforms culture. You need to be in the world, but not of the world, right? Christ against culture says you must not be of the world. Christ of culture says you need to be in the world. Jesus says, yeah, you need to be in the world, but not of the world. The world is created good, but it is fallen, and it must be redeemed. The church is called to be different from the world in its lifestyle and its values, but needs to be present in its institutions and make them more godly. Christ judges the culture and seeks to redeem the culture to make it serve its original purpose. Structure and direction, right? To turn those aspects of the culture towards God rather than towards rebellion. That what Christians are here to do is what Jesus, I mean, Jesus living through us is here to, to change this culture and our culture and every culture to make it serve God rather than to be in rebellion against God. Now, this is a powerful and a difficult call. It's hard to be in the world, but not of it. It really is. And, and I'll tell you the truth. Different Christians are going to live this out in different ways. Right? Uh, it's hard, it's complicated, and we're each different people. We're going to live this out in different ways. None of us is going to do this perfectly. We're going to swing towards rejecting the culture or embracing the culture too much at different times. But, if we're seeking to be Christ to the culture, judging it, but loving it, that's, that's where the influence on society, I think, is going to be its most profound. This is uh, Richard Niebuhr's perspective. It's also my own. Uh, and next week, well, look at that, right on time. Next week, we're going to talk about where is this all going. What is the point? Um, I, I, I need to actually I need to leave you with one more diagram just quickly I'm sorry I, I wasn't going to do this but this is in my notes but I, I feel like if I leave you here I'm leaving you hanging so I'm going to do one more thing where are we today um, where are we today okay class, class dismissed we talked about the, the, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent right um, I like the way Martin Luther puts it the kingdom of our God And the kingdom of this world. The kingdoms of this world, they have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he. Okay, so Jesus came to inaugurate the kingdom of God. The kingdom of this world still exists. And the kingdom of God exists in his people. Okay? His people in his place under his rule. Um, where, and there's going to come a time when the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Right? The kingdom of this world will come to an end. We today are living right here. Theologians call this the tension between the now and the not yet. Okay? Are we living now in the kingdom of God? Yes. Are we living now in the kingdom of God? Not yet. Both are true. We live and we proclaim the kingdom of God in our lives, in our worship, but we also, through our sinfulness, our brokenness, we proclaim that we're not there yet. We're living it out, but not fully. We're doing our best, but it's not quite enough. It's not, it's not until Jesus returns that the kingdom of our God will be fully established on this earth. And that's the hope that we cling to, that Jesus is going to come. And, and we'll be talking more about that next week. All right. Uh, I do have a deeper discovery sheet for you. Thanks for hanging with me. Any questions or comments? Or? Only if you're going to look up Niebuhr's name, it's N-I-E-B-U-H-R. I got the H in the wrong place? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I even have it in my notes. I'm sure it's right in my notes. Here's your deeper discovery sheet. Um, I want to. I'm going to ask you to give you different scripture passages and ask you to look at salvation as wholeness, salvation as liberation, 
Salvation as forgiveness. Salvation as affirmation. And I want you to look at these passages and just ask, which of these speaks most powerfully to you right now? Um, I'm not asking you which one do you believe is true, because I hope that you believe they're all true. But which one speaks most powerfully to you right now? And just take some time to meditate on what salvation means uh, in that context. I also ask you which of the three views of Christ and culture uh, most informs your thinking. Uh, and, and where do you think God is, do you think that Christ transforming culture is what Christ is calling us to do? Um, and if so, how, how might you shape your own view of culture in order to bring it more in line with Christ? Those are, the, those are the deeper discovery questions for this week. Let me pray, and we'll be back together next week. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time. We raced through a lot of material. We raced through so many diagrams. It was fun. <laughs> for me, anyway. <laughs> Lord, I thank you for this chance to talk about the, the salvation that Jesus brings. And there's so much, we're only scratching the surface. I mean, there's so much you could teach about this. And Lord, I, I know that even by limiting it to an hour, there's uh, only so much that I can do. But Lord, I pray that what we talked about tonight would be a blessing to those who hear, whether in this classroom or on video, and that you would be glorified in our lives as we strive to live out the life of the kingdom of God in this world, as we seek to invite people in to become citizens of the kingdom of God, as we seek to demonstrate the, the goodness of the kingdom of God every day in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next week.